So welcome everybody and thank you for joining today. My name is Juliet Tunstall and I'm the External Events Officer at IIED. I'm really delighted to be here today and excited about this discussion we're about to have on capacity building for climate action and ambition, what have we learned? So today's event is co-hosted by IIED and the International Centre for Climate Change and Development and is also part of the London Climate Action Week series of events happening across this week. There's, there's been lots of exciting things um, going on, but we'll hear more about that later. <clears throat> so we're expecting quite a few participants today and excited that we've got people joining us from all over the world. So that is it from me. I think I'm going to hand over now to Andy Norton, IID Director, who's going to give a couple of introductory remarks. Thanks very much. Many thanks, Juliet, and um, welcome everyone, and particularly to our great panel and, um, and our moderator, Salim al Haq, who I'll hand over to in a minute. Um, I'm Andrew Norton, Director of IIED. Uh, just to say a few words of introduction for this event, which we're all really looking forward to. Um, it's part of London Climate Action Week. Uh, many thanks to E3G who have uh, led the charge on setting up the event. And IOD is delighted to be involved in a series of events during this week. Um, it is also importantly part of a series which we host jointly with ICAD, that's the International Centre for Climate Change and Development based in Dhaka, Bangladesh, um, on the climate crisis and links to COVID-19, uh, particularly green recovery and coming out of the pandemic. And it's been great to do this series with Salim and his colleagues. Um, so I'll say a few words about emerging messages um, around that topic um, from London Climate Action Week and also from uh, previous work and events. Um, green recovery, it's important that we see it in terms of tackling multiple challenges, not just climate, but also inequality, development and biodiversity loss. Um, but to achieve that and to do a green recovery out of the pandemic effectively in due course, um, it will be critical that finance is equitable and resources flow um, to the least developed countries and other vulnerable countries um, and in sufficient quantity uh, to fund that recovery and also support people in the crisis. Um, but it's also absolutely vital that resources reach the grassroots, the front, front line of these um, crises of inequality, biodiversity loss and climate. There is also a trick involved to making this work, um, which is that you have to be able to reach people who are in distress, um, particularly from the economic and livelihood impacts of COVID-19 now, um, but also do so in such a way that you effectively build a green and resilient future in the longer term. So this is a considerable challenge, but a compelling one uh, the world over at the moment. Um, moving to this event, um, one of the things which is particularly important is to have effective capacity at the grassroots level. So we're very much looking forward to these thoughts about capacity, not just in a technocratic sense for implementation, but also capacity for leadership and capacity for agency. That's really the kind of capacity building we're talking about here. So with those few words, I'm delighted to hand over to Salim, who will moderate today's session. Great. Thank you very much, Andy, for those uh, words of introduction. It's a pleasure uh, to be in one of our uh, joint uh, webinars, IID ICAD once, and also be part of the London Climate Action Week for this year uh, in, in this series as well. Uh, the topic we have uh, today chosen to speak about is on capacity building, particularly in vulnerable developing countries, particularly least developed countries, but not exclusively LDCs. And uh, I'll very briefly introduce our four uh, excellent panelists and if they can put their cameras on uh, and then I will go to them. The first one is Denise Love Dennis, who is with the Environment Protection Agency in Liberia. Uh, secondly, we have Shanaz Musa who is with uh, the Climate Development Knowledge Network, as well as South-South-North based in South Africa. And 
then we have Susan Nandudu, who is from uh, Uganda, uh, Kampala. And finally, uh, Mizan Khan, who is my colleague in ICAD in Dhaka, Bangladesh. Uh, the, the four of uh, these panelists will be sharing uh, their experiences in the realm of capacity building. So before I, I go to the panelists, let me just uh, mention a couple of things in terms of how we would like to conduct this discussion. Firstly, um, I would like to have it in a conversational style. So I'll ask each of you uh, the first question, which will be to uh, introduce yourself a little bit more about what you do uh, and also share some of your experience, maybe one or two at the most uh, of uh, capacity building, either receiving it or giving it uh, and uh, uh, make it a personal experience. We'd like to know specifics of what you've done. Uh, if you can keep your answers to within three minutes, that would be good. That would give us a chance to come back again for some follow-up questions. Uh, and I'm going to start uh, the conversation with uh, uh, Denise Love. Dennis, Denise, would you like to just share some of your uh, personal experiences uh, and tell us a little bit more about what you do yourself? Denise, please go ahead. Thank you, Salim. Um, like you rightly put it, my name is Denise Love Dennis, and I work with the Environmental Protection Agency here in Liberia. And my involvement into capacity building did back in 2018 when I first uh, received an invitation to my focal point, Mr. Benjamin Kamo, um, to participate in the European Union Capacity Building Initiative. That is the ECBR for short. So ever since then, there was a kind of interactive section that drew my attention and I decided to join, uh, there was a group section that has to do with capacity building, fund lights and everything. But then I chose capacity building because I believe capacity building is a, um, is a bedrock for every developing nation. So as a young person coming up with interest in this climate change issue, I think that the issue of capacity building is key and it will help um, us reach up to some issues that I have that we actually face in in our country. So with this, um, it also serves as like a strengthening of national capacity to enhance um, the transparency element that relates to the Paris Agreement. So that's where my in, in, in interest came from. Excellent. Thank you very much, Denise. So we look forward to having you part of our Article 11 uh, capacity building group in the least developed countries group. So. Uh, in, in future. I, I uh, hope you'll be able to contribute to that going forward. Uh, so let me now turn to Shanaz Musa, who has a lot of experience, not just in least developed countries, but across the world uh, through the CDKN program that her organization, South South North, organizes. Shanaz, would you like to share some of your experience and maybe give a little bit more of your own introduction yeah. as well? Yeah, thank you, Salim. I'm Shanaz Musa from the Climate and Development Knowledge Network, which is a program that is run from South South North in Cape Town, South Africa. It's one of a few programs that we run. And what I'd like to just talk to is how we almost accidentally stumbled into capacity building. So we into the second phase of the climate and development knowledge network where there's a very strong focus on capability building and we call it capability because of the legacy of the world word capacity. Capacity has underpinning it a one directional flow. So it looks like workshops, it looks like training events. And what we do is quite different to that where it's very much a peer to peer sort of um, engagement. And in our first phase of CDKN, the, the program then and the program now is completely demand driven. So we went out and tried to ascertain what the demand was. And more often than not, it was demand for building capabilities in certain areas. And that's how we then evolved into what we are now, which is a knowledge brokering capability building program. What we've learned in this phase of the Climate and Development Knowledge Network and in one of our other programs, which is the Southern Africa Climate Finance Partnership, is that the scoping of the program is 
very, very important. And often when you're putting in a funding proposal for a capability building on, on knowledge management program, you don't realize it can take up to six months to scope it properly. So where we, where we actually learned a big lesson with the CVKN was that we had a three month inception and actually our scoping phase took six months and we had lots of um, engagement with our recipients and, and, more, and it was about laying the ground for what is the capability that needs to be built and how is it done in a mutual partnership way? Um, so, so that one of the drawbacks of that was that we were behind a spend, but we had solid relationships, a solid understanding of what the capability needs were. And we're now in the position where, where the implementation is just ramping up dramatically and we will deliver the program to budget and to deadline. So I think that there's lessons for us as program implementers, but there's also lessons in this for the donors who often um, want us to jump into a program and implement without laying that solid, solid relationships and understanding down. So for me, I think in the years in the sector, it's uh, what I've learned and the, 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 the gold in it is the relationships that we need to build solidly. Great. So thank, thank you, you very Sally. much. Thank you, Shanaz. We'll come to lessons uh, in the second round. So we just want to um, get a little bit more of an understanding of who our audience is in the room today. Um, so great to sort of learn how, if you've had experience in capacity building initiatives before and what type of role you have. So we have uh, a majority of uh, a plurality of implementers, 45% participants, 32% observer supporter, 30, and we have some others and none as well. So uh, let's now move on to our third panelist, who is uh, Susan Nandudu from Kampala in Uganda. Susan, tell us a little bit more about yourself and, and share some experience in the capacity building uh, arena that you have been involved in. Thank you, Salim, and thank you for having me. Um, so my name, again, is Susan Nandudu, and I am here in Uganda. We, I work with an NGO called the African Center for Trade and Development, which I lead. And um, I'll speak to you about the CLAC, which is the capacity strengthening for least developed countries in adaptation to climate change initiative. That was a 10 year capacity building initiative, which um, I was a part of. And I just want to emphasize 10 years. It started as far back as 2004. And um, this, the way it was organized or arranged was um, IIED managed it. And we had 15 partners in the global south. So about three in Asia, and we had the others coming from Africa, West Africa, Eastern Africa, and Southern Africa. It was a great learning opportunity, um, which like Shinaz says, it, it, it didn't follow just a workshop format. Clark um, worked as a fellowship. So we worked as uh, fellows, we had 15 fellows across all um, uh, these regions. We met regularly and we are speaking about capacity building in the era where climate change in Africa, for example, was not yet an issue. Um, it was just imagining the conversations were held amongst a few people. And so Clark, became such an opportunity to build knowledge um, amongst the individuals who were 15, but we used the trainings that we had on a regular basis to train others. So um, because it was a program, we were able to host um, several workshops in country 
uh, which were benchmarked on various trainings at the global level. We would meet uh, to have trainings of trainers, we would meet to have short courses, we would meet um, every single year under the conferences of parties of the UNFCCC and uh, hell, you know that uh, that's a great opportunity to learn. If you're going to be in the course, you're effectively participating, you need capacity building. So that was a great opportunity, not to learn in a workshop setting alone, but to learn from others, to, to interface with processes of negotiations, of policy making, and that has translated back home in all these countries where we, we participated. I, for instance, in, in my country, I sit on several um, government-led platforms um, around climate change. Uh, there's one on adaptation, one on climate um, capacity building, and so ability to shape policies and um, also to influence others to learn, but also participate. I think I'll leave it at that for now. Great, Great. thank you very much, Susan. And, and uh, uh, having known you from the beginning, I, I can see that you have uh, become a capacity builder now in a big way. Thank you very much. And I'm very proud of you. Uh, let me now move on to our fourth uh, 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 panelist, my colleague, uh, Professor Mizan Khan, who uh, wears many hats, but I think a, a relevant hat here is also coordinates the uh, LDC University's Consortium on Climate Change, LUCCC or LUC for short, which uh, my center in Bangladesh uh, coordinates and Professor Mizan is our uh, in charge of that. Mizan, would you like to uh, maybe introduce yourself a little bit and then share some of your reflections on your experience? Let's start with experience. We'll go to reflections and lessons later. Yeah, thank you. In fact, for the last almost 20 years, my main cup of tea was uh, capacity building in the form of teaching and research. Then when I joined uh, ICAD uh, last year as your deputy, my main cup of tea, again, reinforcing, I'm trying to reinforce the image of ICAD as kind of, uh, as kind of what I call ICAD is a think come action tank with our main focus on capacity building. So with this idea, and uh, uh, you know all that uh, back about three years, Dr. Selim initiated the establishment of the LAC with some university faculty members. And now we um, uh, LAC has become an official LDC program of 47 governments. And we have about 15 members, uh, member universities from uh, South Asia, East, West, and Southern Africa. And uh, our uh, we from LAC as secretariat working, uh, I can working as a secretariat. So we advise and facilitate, for example, the establishment of uh, a capacity building uh, resource, uh, a resource and capacity building platform under those universities in other LDC countries. Uh, in Bangladesh, let me share the experience personal that I have as the government ministry officials are transferable. So for the last 20 years, I have been serving as the lead negotiator on climate finance and I'm kind of institutional memory. So at least uh, a year, three to four times, we organize uh, capacity building workshops for our government officials uh, for climate negotiations. This is one thing we do. We have published also uh, several, uh, one book where Dr. Selim is a co-author on capacity building published by Routledge and several articles. Uh, we also organize a peer-to-peer -peer learning with government officials. Uh, our ICAT has uh, signed a memorandum of understanding and agreement with several of the ministries, including finance, planning, ERD, and we often organize learning hub events. Oh, yeah we share our experiences, uh, particularly focusing on capacity building in adaptation area. So these kind of are my main experiences in capacity building, I will share Thank you. later. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Mizan. Uh, so let me now um, go to the second round of questions and I'll mix it up uh, in terms of who I go to next. Uh, let me uh, go to Shanaz, you uh, shared with us earlier the experience of CDKN and SSN 
uh, in, in the realm of uh, doing things that then uh, ended up with capacity building being the common thread and moving from the concept of capacity building to capabilities and relationships and peer to peer. So I'd like you to tell us a little bit about what you are going to do, but I stopped you. What kind of lessons do you think uh, future programs, particularly donors, funders, who are thinking of investing in capacity building programs uh, might want to take on board? So uh, a, a bit of lesson learning experience sharing, uh, if you don't mind. Shanaz. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Salim. So as I mentioned earlier, and I, and I did get a bit carried away when I was, uh, yeah, because it, it's very close, dear to my heart, is the first lesson, I think, is that thyroscoping is needed. And that this needs to be accounted for. It needs to be built into budgets and donors need to be quite aware that while this is happening, there won't be any tangible outputs um, being, being delivered, but it will be more about building the relationship. So I think there needs to be a cognizance of that and it needs to be reflected when budgets are being prepared and work plans and deliverables are being um, decided. Another, re another lesson I think that we've learned is that capability strengthening is an iterative process. And an example of this, and my colleague Mary Dupont very kindly shared it in the chat box, is a game that we've developed with the Ethiopian government, but just to talk you through the process of that, so, so you get the feel for what these iterative processes look like, how your program has to be nimble and adaptive, and how the donors need to be cognizant of this and not hold you accountable to a very linear delivery model. So in CDK in phase two, the Ethiopian, the country program work we do there was around mainstreaming gender and climate change. And gender was a priority agenda for government and CDKN was able to offer assistance through local, a local climate and gender expert on how best to improve the mainstreaming of this cross cutting issue into the climate change priority sectors, institutions and projects. So again, an initial scoping report explored the current situation across the main federal government institutions. This report was then used as an input to a workshop. So we'll see here, there's the scoping, there's a report, then there's a workshop. The workshop brought together several ministries of government, as well as a number of departments within ministries that did not normally engage. So for example, the gender and the planning departments, again here, it, it's looking beyond what you normally do and opening up the circle and being adaptive. So this led to improved communication with parties intending to improve, and it, it, it improved coordination. It further served as a launch board for the development of a gender coordination platform. And CDKN is using this as an entry point to develop a gender resource pack that is responding to the capability building needs of government. This resource pack is going to be tested now in November at the training of trainers event. And then from here, we're taking this further into 2021. So this whole work takes long and you need to be adaptive and the process is very iterative. So right. for me, I think there's, there's that, um, those lessons that we're right. not chasing a linear process here. We need to be adaptive and we need to realize it's a complex process. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you, Thank you very much. I think I got carried Shut away up. again. You, no, no, you, uh, <laughs> it's always good to hear people yeah. speaking from the heart and with passion. And yeah. as you make an extremely important point that the capacity building initiatives are very um, personalized. There are, mm -hmm. you, are, you are building the capacity and the capabilities of individuals. And so I'd like to uh, turn to Susan now, whom I've known for many years. And when we started working together, when she became a CLAC fellow, I used to run that program in IID. She used to work for one organization. She's since been moving on and doing lots of different things and has increased both her own capacities and also helping others build capacity. So Susan, a little bit of 
you know, reflection using your own experience of how over time you were able to improve, enhance uh, your ability to work with others in different organizations and government, non-government, uh, different arenas, uh, and, and how you navigate that over time as an individual, uh, a person who is build, going up the capabilities ladder, if you like. Susan, please share some of your reflections. So it's been a pleasure working with you, Salim, and learning a lot from you. One of the learnings I've carried is storytelling and still learning. Uh, we always said, you always told us that um, sharing stories is important. And so um, how have I navigated the learning uh, across? Um, so I think for me, Clark, built the passion uh, for climate change for me. And it rooted it in me that um, it's just a part of me wherever I go. Uh, most people will know that uh, anything I do is around climate change. And so um, at the beginning, it was, uh, it was such a, a new area for me. I didn't understand what it was about. And because of the exposures, I dug deep and I, I, I could read a little more, go to the World Bank, get uh, all the exposures. And over time, I realized that um, it, the capacity that was within me needed to be shared, um, even beyond the, the programming that we had under Clark. So um, I guess because it became a, a passion of mine, um, it became quite easy to even mentor others to always speak about it anywhere and anyhow. And so, um, but, but I must emphasize that through the Clark program, because it was a long-term program, the exposures with the various stakeholders, um, particularly government opened doors, um, to, to, to bring civil society. Remember the Clark program was largely with civil society. So the civil society voice became uh, a significant voice in the climate change conversation here in Uganda. And uh, so, so we have been part and parcel of all the policymaking processes and continue. Right now we are, we, Uganda just launched the process of reviewing the, the NDCs today and uh, we are part of the process. So. Um, I guess that the core is that as the individual, the human capacity is developed, there is no limit to where that capacity can go. And you, you carry it with you. Um, so in the organization where I am right now, there was no climate change work when I came and I was able to integrate it into the work. And now we have a full program on climate action. Um, I know several other Clark fellows who have moved into spaces where they have influenced the institutions where they work to even attract funding into programming for climate change. So, um, so it's really critical to individual, get the capacity of the individual because it's into other spaces. Thank you. Sir. Thank you very much, Susan. And, and uh, I hope you continue to do this good work that you've been doing for so long. Uh, Denise, let me come to you now. You're, you're the youngest uh, negotiator from Liberia, I understand, and youngest amongst the panelists. And you've just started uh, your career recently. Uh, and you've been the recipient of uh, capacity building. You mentioned ECBI, and I'm sure there have been others. Uh, from your perspective, what kinds of things do you find as the sort of uh, the recipient of information, knowledge, capacity building, training, whatever efforts are made? What do you find most useful? What, what is, from your perspective, things that you find uh, that are uh, uh, better than others, if you like? Denise, please. Okay, Salim, um, thank you so much. Um, so like from what I said from the onset, it's like capacity building indeed is the background for every developing nation. 
like when I started, I, I knew nothing about climate change, actually to say. So joining the process of e, um, the ECBI, it has opened my mind and opened my own interest in getting to know what it is and what action can be done. So it is against this backdrop that I show key interest in seeing how best networking can be a key factor and in exploring what it is that I, I want to see as an action. So with this, we were able to um, show interest and serve as um, bus rate holder for the, the, the ECBI and I can say IIED as well, because um, it just did not give me a platform wherein I can just visit um, stay in country, but it also created a platform that I was able to participate in the international conferences. So that I was able to, to, to join. So the born, I was also able to join in Poland, as well as the recent one in Madrid. So the networking aspect has been key because um, what we do is that when your capacity is built, it's not anything for you to stay, to stay on it, but sharing your other platform and see how best you can have more people involved in the process is the, that's that's key so that when you shall have left the few maybe probably by death or something that something someone that can continue to 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 build on what you what you've seen so the issue of of training which is key as well as public awareness and education with the issue of um peer-to-peer -peer exchanges when i say peer-to-peer -peer exchanges it's kind of key because it gives you an opportunity to actually tell your fellow colleague what it is like and what's intervention. And with that, other people can understand the processes that of which you're going through. Being a GM um, negotiator, a GM negotiator for my country, is like a dream that I saw and I wish to, I really wanted to be there. At this juncture, as I speak to you, I'm not just um, writing press releases, I'm not just writing um, brochures or doing brochures and everything. But I'm also involved with the country's um, own plan when it comes to for climate action. For example, I'm also with the, like I said, with the national determined contributions, but I'm totally involved in it, giving my input. And there's a lot that I'm learning within the process. And as also, the, um, there was a, there's this program, the Climate for Action Empowerment, which is key. And the Climate for, 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 for Action Empowerment take a key look on empowering people to see how best they can actually respond to this climate action. So my uh, involvement with my national delegation at COP and now being practical on the ground is a key lesson that I can say that I've learned because it also helps uh, to strengthen uh, national capacity as well as looking at the facilitation of technologies development and the dissemination of, of this deployment as well. So communication, it also links to the same thing that has to do with um, capacity building. Thank you, thank you. I can see we have a, a budding climate champion at the national as well as the global negotiations in you, Denise. And I look forward to tracking your career as you grow uh, in that. Uh, let me now finally ask, uh, uh, come to Mizan for the final question in this round, but we also are having questions uh, asked in the Q&A a box, so I would uh, ask all the panelists to take a look, look at those questions. And in the next round, I'll ask you to pick a question and answer it. Uh, uh, but let me ask uh, Mizan to share a little bit of his reflection based on a huge amount of experience on capacity building on some lesson learning going forward. So what do you think are key elements to put into the design of capacity building programs uh, in the future, particularly on climate change, uh, from your experience, some key lessons. Yeah, uh, one key lesson that I uh, share first is that capacity building is not a discrete one-off act. It's a process. It takes time. Uh, you cannot have, for example, uh, quantitative indicators immediately in capacity building. So it's mostly of a uh, process. So if you want to do capacity building, you have to arrange in phases. Uh, first phase to begin with, just about raising awareness and sensitization. Then gradually you design your program based on the level of uh, uptake by the stakeholders. This is one lesson. And then our 
uh, conception of capacity building, earlier capacity building was taken mostly in the form of training, for example, workshops and training. Actually, capacity building is not just workshop and training. Capacity building, as I mentioned, we do peer-to-peer -peer learning, for example. And then we also do capacity building. One lesson that students, for example, we uh, give students the semester or thesis task. They go to the field and based on experience, they stay with the community and they do write their thesis or semester assignments. And that way, both the student as well as the community learn and, uh, from each other. So this is another kind of uh, regular constant job. So to me, capacity building has to be a continuous process. Uh, and uh, the projects, on, we cannot depend on the project uh, process. We need to have a programmatic approach for capacity building, at least seven, eight years long. And for that, we need whatever little amount, but sustainable kind of support. Uh, uh, LDC universities, another experience, LDC universities don't have much funding for research, for example. That is why we need research support from the donors, from the development partners, which was not a culture before because development partners used to work mostly with the governments. But now I think development partners are buying in our idea that universities, which have at least uh, some kind of expertise, multi and interdisciplinary for climate change, uh, this kind of expertise is required. So development partners are coming up to slowly accept the idea that the university level institution uh, should be funded for Capacity, real capacity building if we want to get the big uh, back out of the little money uh, spent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mizan. So uh, we are now going to move to the audience Q&A uh, session. And uh, we already have a number of questions in the Q&A box. I would encourage anybody who has more questions to put them in there. And as Juliet mentioned at the beginning, you can, if a question you find important, you can uh, put press, press the uh, thumbs up a symbol and make it go up the ladder. So I see that one of the questions has attracted uh, uh, quite a lot of support. I'm going to put that to Shanaz to start with. The question is from Ben Robinson, who says, uh, uh, hello, are there any standardized capacity building methodologies that you all use to ensure programmatic quality. Uh, there is always lots of talk about plans, but never enough about quality actions. It's a very good question, Ben. Thank you. Uh, Shanaz, um, any, any reflections you. on that? Yes, yes. So thank you. And I think part of it is that, so I'm breathing because it's mm -hmm. something we've thought about also quite a bit. There is no cookie cutter meth methodology. So it's all often demand driven. It's what is needed, what you decide to respond. And maybe that's the methodology, which is a responsive approach. I think what we like to um, advocate is the peer to peer, where, where, you, where you get people possibly from Latin America, Asia, and Africa together to share learnings on, on similar issues. And often that sort of methodology, the peer-to-peer, -peer, has a more lasting impact than having workshops where a consultant flies in, does the workshop, and then leaves. So I think in terms of an overarching methodology, I'd like to advocate for the peer-to-peer -peer learning with after that, where people stay, where you form almost like community of practices, where people stay engaged and where they can keep conversing about the issues that's facing them and looking for solutions. Great, thank so you very much. partly answered that. Thank you, yes, that, that's excellent. Let me uh, now uh, take another question, which is for Professor Mizan. I'll read the question, Mizan, and then I'll ask you to uh, answer it. It's from Mary Dupar from CDKN and ODI. Uh, the question for Dr. Mizan Khan is, how do you balance demand, quote unquote demand, for specific types of capability or capacity building and knowledge exchange 
with supply, again, quote unquote, supply gaps that you perceive, especially with the peer-to-peer -peer exchange among government officials, as you mentioned. For example, what if they don't have any interest whatsoever in learning about gender, youth and disability issues in climate ad adaptation, but you think that it is an important issue to bring up and increase their knowledge and skill? Uh, how do you navigate that? Interesting question. Mizad, let's share some yes. thoughts on, on that. Yes, yes, thank you. You know, uh, as a, a half economist kind of, my original uh, background was economics. Now I call myself half economist. Demand and supply are very important issues. Okay, so for, uh, it's the demand that drives supply. So how to generate demands, for example, in peer-to-peer -peer learning or uh, we uh, always interact with government officials. Nowadays, compared to earlier years, for example, uh, we find young generation is much more interested in learning. Uh, even if they have permanent positions, but this young generation with at least a master's or PhD from some good universities. Most of the government officials nowadays have at least a master's program from good universities. So they have already the appetite for learning and we encourage them. And they also get the benefit because in government offices, if someone not just as a bureaucrat can serve as an expert that gives them an added edge over other peers. So government officials now understand uh, the beauty and enjoy uh, the beauty of these uh, having expertise. And the supply side, once we get to know the demand, then uh, we uh, manage, arrange the supply. In Bangladesh, we can tell, we have compared to many, not just compared to the LDCs, but compared to many LDCs, we have good, good expertise. Uh, in climate change management, uh, starting from negotiations of skills down to particularly adaptation skills. Because Bangladesh is kind of uh, uh, a country with age-old experiential learning. So many other people and other countries are learning from our adaptation model. So sub we have not much problem in the supply of uh, kind of knowledge and expertise. And as I mentioned, government officials now understand that if they can develop expertise in certain area, they can have better even professional positions. Uh, they can go on secondment on leave and so go to serve the international bureaucracy for two, three years and they come. And many Bangladeshi government officials nowadays are availing that opportunity. So there is kind of an inherent uh, demand which was incipient before, which was dormant before, but now it's coming up. So Thank you. I find no problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the eternal supply and demand problem, we have to find a way to balance it uh, well. Let me yes. uh, take the next question, which is also from Mary Dupar. Uh, from CDKN and ODI, and I'll, I'll ask Susan to respond to this one. Uh, it's a question for all speakers, but I'll give it to Susan first. She says, at ODI, we are quite concerned that the language around capacity building in international policies and frameworks still has some colonial baggage, quote unquote, around it. See our decolonizing development series. Uh, she's given a, a, a link to the ODI uh, paper here. Uh, of course, Dr. Huck, you have been at the forefront of reframing and subverting this notion of capacity building completely, and Shanaz has mentioned it, but it seems we cannot reject the phrase of capacity building completely. The language is hardwired in the Paris Agreement. Thoughts about terminology and what we do with it. Susan, um, any thoughts on this? You, you, you uh, are aware of this issue, uh, and you are also a practitioner yourself. So how do you navigate between these uh, uh, use of terminologies with a, a sort of a colonial uh, tinge to them? And how do we then move on with that uh, in a practical way? Susan. Um, thank you. It's a very, very important question. Now, um, I have found that in the climate change space, the, the terminology now when you are with communities terminology doesn't actually work you are really speaking uh, about the same thing communicated differently um so i i prefer as a personal at a personal level to, to have my contribution more at at the grassroots where uh, 
we, we really want to see action, where we really want to see um, utilization of, of, of the capacity and also the ability to attract the resources to get the, the capacity where it is needed. Like Shinaz says, it should be demand driven where a community or a community of practice needs um, a, a certain set of capacity to strengthen, um, then it should be supported with funding and the technical expertise. So um, I, I, as a person, I, I, I don't dwell so much into the semantics, uh, but I like that, Salim, you have always done the bridge for us. The capacity strengthening would be a more appropriate terminology, terminology for me because it is always evolving. Um, I, I can't say that at Clark when we started, we were speaking about capacity or understanding, just understanding capacity, uh, adaptation to climate change. Today, we really need more capacity in attracting financing. So um, as it evolves, it is capacity building. It is capacity strengthening. So I will leave that to the scientists to, to, to give more um, uh, analysis into. Thank you, Salim, over to you. Great. Thank you, Susan. Uh, uh, wonderful practical experience. I think that is that should be the, the, uh, the higher level rather than the semantics of what words we uh, choose or don't choose. Uh, let me turn to Denise now. There's a question which is for all participants, but I want to ask you, especially in the situation that you're in in Liberia, uh, about the impact that COVID is having, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, those of us in, in Asia, we are hearing that in, in uh, Africa, it's not as bad as one had uh, anticipated. And one of the reasons being put forward is your experience already with the Ebola outbreak and, and the pandemics more generally, and also a younger population. So would you like to just very quickly reflect on uh, what what is happening? Tell us a little bit about what's happening in Liberia, and then your reflections on are there some lessons here in dealing with the COVID-19 crisis that are also applicable to the climate change crisis? Denise. Thank, thank you, Salim. Um, this question indeed, um, now take me back to a little bit uh, kind of emotional uh, trend when I said this because um, the index case of Ebola, uh, sorry, coronavirus in, um, in my country came as close as my boss, um, whose was the index case when it first hit the country. So we know the trauma it brought to us as a, as a country and it was actually devastating with the news and the panic, uh, people panic and everything. But uh, with the help of the health ministry and the, the citizens, I can safely say, we were able to try to uh, follow um, the, the measures within in country. So the, the health protocols that were delivered, um, we tried to follow it. But now let's look at the global pandemic, some of those things that I see that um, it hinders. We should have had um, SB, both SB um, uh, 52 and COP26. But unfortunately, because of this pandemic, it has been postponed. Um, so decisions in this area have been like on a, on a, on a low, low space. So we also know that um, this uh, pandemic, which now brought uh, the issue of virtual or, or, or training and meetings, um, instead of us meeting face to face to come to real actions that we will be able to put, to put forth on, 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 on the ground. So the, the pandemic also includes um, the issue of having uh, a priorities by national governments towards the climate change ambition was shifted from um, the actual thing to health emergency response. So with all of these uh, global uh, uh, momentum for climate ambition and the action was kind of draining strictly as the result of this COVID-19. So as a country, we, we still did not let um, the issue of COVID to to stop us from trying to do what we need to do, what actions we needed to be done. So that's why we've, in the process of COVID, we took the up or all, all the precautionary measures, but then we were able to initiate the process of reviewing our nationally determined contributions. And which is key that we can safely say um, that bef our time, our target is to by 2021 made latest that we can be able to submit our nationally determined 
contributions um, to the UNFCCC amidst the COVID um, uh, situation. The cases in Liberia right now is not on the increase as it was, but we can also tell you that we, we're still following the precautionary measures and trying to ensure that climate actions, which is key, to be taken into actions. Thank you, Denise, for that, that wonderful experience. I know that situation in, in Africa generally and Liberia is extremely important for us. Um, let me now shift the conversation a little bit uh, towards uh, looking forward to COP26 in particular in the UNFCC process. And I'll, I'll ask Mizan uh, to start this. And if we have time, hopefully we can hear from others as well. Uh, in terms of the capacity building issue, uh, how do you see this featuring in COP26? And in particular, beyond COP26 in the stock take that is going to take place. I think this is something that um, perhaps we can collectively put our minds towards uh, thinking about a stock take on Article 11, which is the article dealing with uh, Article 11 of the Paris Agreement, which is the article dealing with uh, capacity building, whether or not we can collectively do some good lesson learning and uh, recommendations to the UNFCC process, if not by COP26, but definitely by the stock take. Uh, Mizan, any thoughts on this, how we might take it forward? Uh, yes, uh, together with you, I have been working uh, on capacity building at uh, the last few COPs, starting from 2017. We have been organizing capacity building day, and now we work very closely with PCCB, uh, which uh, is uh, a body under the UNFCCC, uh, and we organize many different events, week-long events. So, and also under PCSB, there is a network. We uh, are part of this network and we extend, we need to extend these networks. There is a, again the Santiago uh, network. Um, so we uh, need to extend this uh, our capacity building networks because uh, as I always tell that more than two thirds, 75% uh, of the NDCs have put the building as a condition to implementation of their NDCs. So this shows that earlier capacity building model uh, through the technical assistance program didn't work well. So there is a paradigm, there is a the need for paradigm shift and article 11 together with article 12 and 13 gives us that potential to shift that paradigm. And we need to upscale this. And how can we do that? As I mentioned, that uh, earlier capacity building targeted to government officials did not work much because government officials are transferable. So we need to have sustainable capacity breeder, what I call, and universities can serve as the capacity breeder. Governments come and go, but universities will stay. So we need to strengthen universities. And I think at COP we can organize side events to uh, raise this issue, our voice louder, that the government uh, role will be there. Government will serve as the administrative hub and coordinator of all these activities, but universities should be put at the center. So this is our message and we need to uh, continue our message at uh, COP26 and also beyond. So this is my Thank you submission. very much. Thank you, Mizan. We are coming towards the end of our uh, session. Um, I know that there are quite a few other questions in the Q&A box. I'm afraid we may not be able to answer all of them, but we will keep them on record. And, and if you give us your contacts, we'll try and send you answers uh, individually uh, if we can. Uh, but let me uh, uh, make the same uh, proposition to uh, Shanaz. Uh, given that you know you do a lot of work in CDK and a lot of partnerships and network building, can we collectively do some significant level of uh, assessment, self-assessment amongst us, our, our partners and networks on uh, what has worked uh, well, what has worked not so well, uh, what kinds of things do we feel need to be done more uh, and, and uh, invested in more and take that as sort of a personal or, or organizational stock taking uh, to COP26. And then, as I said, in, in the even bigger evaluation stock take that's going to take place uh, in a couple of years time 
where we can actually start doing these substantial learning exercises. Uh, and we can do this very easily with the Paris Committee on Capacity Building, which is the, the institutional structure under Article 11, with whom we have a very good relationship. And I'm sure they would be very open to us offering to do this. Shanaz, any thoughts on that? Um, so Salim, I think completely it is something that that I feel should be done. It serves as a baseline from where we then move forward. My only concern around this is the coordinating such a huge um, activity. And it will need funding to do it because I think there's no organization that readily has funding to do this sort of stock take and baseline. But I think there's value in doing it, taking it to COP and then using it as the baseline and following the trajectory of the capability building activities like from the south how's the north and south engaging so i think there is a lot of value in it Stalin. and i'd Excellent. like us to encourage yeah to encourage that it gets done great thank you very much Anaz. and and so on that note uh i will uh, uh thank all of our panelists for uh, your uh, sharing your time and your experience and your thoughts. Uh, I think that was a very useful session. Apologies to participants who gave questions that we weren't able to address, but as I said, we hope to be able to uh, maybe send you uh, answers to your questions uh, later. Uh, in terms of next steps from my side, before I hand over to Andy to share some uh, final thoughts, uh, I, I suggest maybe Shanaz, we do a little bit of thinking about a proposal maybe on, on, on how to do this substantially. Yeah. Yes, uh, completely we, Salim, yeah. Let, let us, you know, IID ICAD together and all our panelists, we'll invite them yeah. to be part of the exercise. And it, in my view, the structure should be a self-assessment a self learning. Yeah of people who've done this and, and give their own experiences rather than an external evaluation mm. of something mm. that has been done. Because the paradigm of, of evaluation is a very donor-driven evaluation of you know, what you did with money. Whereas what I am more interested in is what did you learn? What did people mm. learn? And, mm. and how do we then capture that learning in a substantive manner that can make a difference going forward? So uh, thank you all the panelists for an extremely interesting uh, discussion. I'm sure all the participants found it interesting as well. Uh, so with that, let me invite Andy to share some further reflections uh, on what we heard and also maybe a little bit about what we might do going forward. Andy. Thank you ever so much, Salim, and many thanks to all of the participants. It was a really rich discussion. I think what emerged for me just quickly without um, sort of going over the ground you covered so ably, um, is a sort of distinction between uh, business as usual understanding of capacity building, where it's kind of uh, driven by external top-down donor kind of project timetables and project designs with kind of rigid deliverables um, and without, by short-term sort of timeframes and without a real view to building capability for the future, not just capability to implement, but capability to lead and determine agendas. And Salim, the work you've done down the years with ICAB, but also with IIED is really exemplary in that sense. We've heard about uh, the university's consortium, the LUC, but also the CLAP Fellowship Programme vividly from Susan. That was um, so great really in developing a generation of leaders. So on the other side, you've then got this kind of business unusual concept of strengthening or building capability and capacity, which is about networks, horizontal and mutual learning, um, complex nonlinear processes. It's also personal and human, as we got the stories today, um, patient and long-term um, and requires patient resourcing and patient funding. Um, I think that's really critical to it, um, to build, if you like, leadership in new sites, um, particularly grassroots sites. And building communities of practice, I think that was a term that Shanaz used, and it's also iterative and involves learning from the grassroots and learning from experience. So um, maybe the big challenge, Salim, is how to get a shift in that understanding in um, for a like the UNFCCC where the language is embedded, but many people come at it with a business as usual perspective. So how to get that shift. 
Um, I don't have, I mean, I'm very happy that we join um, the initiative that um, Shanaz and you just proposed. Um, and in terms of taking this work forward, I think it's a question of continuing to learn from what has worked in the past. Um, I think we all know when this tastes and smells and feels like something that genuinely builds capacity. So it's how we can draw the lessons from that um, and take them into, you know, the fora where it matters, which includes donor culture and practice, but also includes uh, the UNFCCC where the language is embedded. So it was a really, really rich discussion um, and huge thanks to you, Celine, for steering it so well and huge thanks to our panelists as well, to Prof Mizan, to Danise, to Shanaz and to Susan. It was just great, many thanks. Thank you very much, Andy, for those uh, uh, words and, and also for your willingness to uh, take this forward. Let's, let's do some uh, constructive brainstorming on that. So before we close, let me just uh, share a few thoughts. I'm not going to try and summarize the discussion, but try and think about how we might take things forward. And in the chat box, I've put in uh, a, a website called Gobeshana. Gobeshana is a Bangla word for uh, research, and it's a platform of a number of universities and research institutions based in Bangladesh, where we hold an annual conference every January. Uh, normally, over the last six years, we've had it in person, several hundred people at my university in Dhaka. Uh, but, uh, from next year onwards, from 2021, from the 21st to the 24th of January, we are going to make it a virtual event and we are going to make it a global event with a very big focus on locally led adaptation to climate change. And we, over the years in ICAD, we have uh, done lots of short courses and trainings. We run a master's degree in climate change and development. And we have several hundred alumni from all over the world who have uh, participated in some of our capacity building activities and we stay in close touch with our alumni. So uh, for us, the, the training and learning is just one step in a long-term relationship. And so we are going to be using our alumni all over the world to help us run sessions on a 24 uh, hour over four days uh, basis with sessions aimed at different geographies, including Eastern Africa, Western Africa. We may do them in French for West Africa. We'll do them in Latin America and Spanish, et cetera. And so I would like to invite anybody who's listening and participating here uh, who would be interested to look up our website. Please do join us in the Gobeshana Conference in uh, January next year. And not just the one-off conference in January next year, which is 2021, it's the first year of the new decade. We hope to use this as a launching pad for the next decade of next, next 10 years of developing our capacity at speed and at scale to deal with the impacts of climate change. And we'll make this an annual event every January. We'll come together, we'll take stock, we'll see what's working, what's not working, and how can we speed up and expand on the work that uh, everybody is doing. And it's very much based on individuals taking uh, an interest and in doing things. So one of the questions uh, was on what happens when you train people who aren't interested. If somebody's not interested, there's not a lot you can do about it. But if an individual is interested, then there is a lot you can do to help uh, expand on that interest, in, invest in that interest, and enable people with that interest to take things forward. And that really is the essence of the capacity building paradigm that we try to do in my center in ICAD with our partners and our uh, friends. It is, is, I call it building social capital or another way of making friends and working with friends. And that's really what I've been doing my entire uh, career and I enjoy doing that. So I'm going to close by inviting everybody who's on this call and particularly the panelists who are with us uh, to join forces with us in planning the Gobeshana Conference and in taking us beyond January 2021 uh, to take us to 2030 on a 10 year journey of building capacities at scale across the world, but particularly in the most vulnerable developing countries, which is where we have uh, the greatest interest from our side. Uh, so thank you and goodbye.